I don't know. I, I'm 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 partial to soccer because I'm passionate about it. I know when I was growing up, we didn't have strong, confident female role models. I followed my big brother around. He's two years older than me, and was, whether it was playing street hockey, tackle football, you name it, I was always on his heels, dying to get in the game. Say you're going in the wrong direction because <laughs> it was halftime and we switched our, I love our direction that. and I'd forgotten about that. <laughs> and uh, I was on this like dead, like, you know, breakaway. You can get five coaches in the same room and we all thought five different opinions on maybe how Kerry Taylor was as a player. <laughs> I was a great I was a great player. And then when I got off the field, she would say you did so great. I loved watching you play. No matter, I could have the worst game of my life. And it was the president of the soccer, Deaf Soccer Association asking if I'd be interested in the in the volunteer job that was the head, head coach of the Deaf team. And I actually was extremely excited. I'm Carrie Taylor, and this is Women Talking Football. Right. So, hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Carrie Taylor, and you're listening to Women Talking Football. And we have former women's national team player, player Heather Mitts and three-time gold medalist. Heather, thanks for calling in today. No problem. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we're super excited to have you on. And typically how we do each show is I kind of have the guests kind of give us their own background and talk about, you know, how they got involved in in the sport the game of soccer and then we kind of go from there so can you give us the lowdown on where heather came from and her soccer (laughs) soccer journey sure um well i'm from cincinnati ohio and my parents were always uh very active growing up um my mom actually wanted me to play tennis uh and my dad wanted me to play basketball my dad played uh, his freshman year at University of Kentucky. So Ooh, that's a um, big basketball school for sure. Yes, it is. It runs in the family. Um, and I also had a brother who was 18 months younger than me. And so we were always out in the backyard playing sports growing up and just doing everything. And, um, you know, my brother loved soccer and we were highly competitive and I wanted to do anything that he did. Uh, so we were out there every single day having these 1v1 battles and, um, I just always loved playing and I guess it was my freshman year, uh, between my brother and I and just how busy we were with all of our activities. My mom, you know, came up and said, you know, we need you to focus on one sport. Um, what's it going to be? And, uh, at that point I'd already been burnt out of tennis and okay. decided, you know, I was still playing basketball and softball and a couple other ones, but you know, I said soccer, she said soccer, you can't play soccer when you're old. And I said, that's okay. Cause I love it. And I was just hoping to maybe get a college scholarship and, Mm. you know, one thing led to another. So I was really lucky to be able to do something I love for as long as I, I did. Right. So you, um, you went to the university of Florida, correct? Yes. Go Gators. Yeah. So (laughs) tell me, tell me about that, that experience, because I actually, was in the crowd when you guys won the national championship. Oh, no way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, it was pretty amazing. Uh, you know, I went there when they were only in their second year Mm -hmm. of existence and I literally went on my recruiting trip, uh, just to go check out university of Florida. I had zero intentions of going there, uh, Mm -hmm. because it was pretty far away from Cincinnati. And I just fell in love with not only Becky Burley um, and the coaching staff, but also just the university. I mean, Mm -hmm. I thought it was amazing. Uh, And I also took into consideration the fact that if I had an injury or if I didn't love playing soccer, which school would I want to go to? And UF was kind of the whole package. Um, I just lucked out, honestly, with the fact that we ended up having a really good team. Um, and we won the SEC every year I was there, but then we, <laughs> we showed up at the, the national championship our junior year and, uh, were able to go in and we were heavy underdogs and we just had a great team and believed in ourselves. And it was an amazing experience to be able to go there and win a national championship. And 
I owe so much of my success to Becky um, Burley and, and Vic Campbell, who are still there. Right, um, they're right. there since the very beginning. Uh, they definitely helped me to to have the opportunity to to play professionally and play on the national team. So that's, that's it was amazing. That that's so awesome. And and I'm going to share this with you. While you were talking about winning the championship, I got chills because I was thinking back of like being there and watching you guys win it because you know as everyone knows, North Carolina has always been this huge dynasty within Mm -hmm. college sports. So it's, I I love it when, you know, that, that team sneaks in there and, and like everything kind of comes together at once. And yeah, Uh, it's pretty amazing because they, I think at that point had won 15 national championships. Mm -hmm. Um, And we actually had played them earlier in the year and my freshman year, they beat us nine one. My my soft yeah, ouch. Um, <laughs> my sophomore year, five one, and then we played them earlier in the year, my junior year, and we lost in overtime two to one. So, when we got to the national championship, it was kind of like that perfect time to be able to have a little bit of redemption. Um, and you know, we we did have you know Danielle Fotopoulos and right. and Abby Wambach just happened to be on our team also, and a lot of other great players that even though they didn't play in the national team, were just we had a solid solid group. So um, it was pretty cool to be able to go in there and, and to win win. That, that's awesome. So let's kind of spin it, and we'll probably come back to all your your awesome playing um, stories as well. But let's talk about kind of what you've done post retirement, because that's kind of what the premise of my show is about is I want to dive into what people are doing within the game. That's not just, you know, the, the on the field type things. So what are some things I know you're, um, you just started a business with, um, and what are, what are some things that you're involved in and, and how are you kind of, you know, having that second chapter, um, post, playing career? Yeah, it's uh, definitely been an interesting one. Um, You know, before I ended up uh, continuing continuing to play soccer, I was going to go back and get my my master's in sports broadcasting. Um, And so I did start doing a little bit of the soccer analysis uh, right after graduation. You know, I really enjoyed it. I thought I get my master's. I never ended up going back because I continued playing, but I was able to kind of dabble a little bit throughout um, my playing career with all my numerous injuries that I had. And I just figured that would be the natural segue for me uh, when I was done playing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess what I didn't factor in was that I wanted to start a family and you know, that would be a really difficult lifestyle to have. Um, I am lucky enough to be able to be a part of the SEC soccer broadcast um, that I do for college women's soccer in Mm -hmm. the fall. Um, But other than that, you know, it's kind of things here and there, Um, nothing that consistent with the TV side of things, Mm -hmm. which I really wasn't expecting. Um, I thought that would be the natural uh, thing for me to fall into. I did start a family. I have two kids. My daughter, Blake, is one and my son, Connor, is three. Um, you have your hands full with that. I do. Sure. <laughs> I do. It is a full-time job, uh, the most respect for all moms out there. Um, but the best job in the world also. Right. Uh, so, um, just join the soccer and then Angela, Hugh Cleese and I, as you kind of just mentioned, um, saw the challenges that were presented with all female athletes when you retire. Uh, we didn't think that it would be quite as challenging as it has been Mm -hmm. for both of us. And, uh, we just, you know, got together and we figured, you know, why don't we make present something for, for the future, um, for the future female athletes that are going through the same thing that we're going through so that they don't have to go through all the troubles that we've had to. So just putting everything in place. So it's a one-stop shop for them, um, to be able when they're ready, <laughs> right. cause I know it takes time. Um, and we're all stubborn cause we've been so successful on the playing field that we don't think we need help, but right. you know, we wanted to have something in place in case those athletes do. Um, and hopefully it won't take them two, three, and four years, uh, to have to come to us, you know, if they need us, we're there. And, uh, it's not just for the female athletes. It's also for, you know, entrepreneurs and females that are maybe, uh, transitioning to their second job. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's been fun also because 
at first we thought it was going to be just female athletes and it's been um, a lot of other amazing women uh, that we're happy to help. Right. And, and so for those of you that are listening, um, the company's called Cirrus Platinum and their website <laughs> is cirrusplatinumgroup.com. Um, check it out. It's brand management and um, financial investment and just how to kind of, you know, help transition into the career after, um, you know, the, the field or the court or the, the boardroom or, or whatever it may be. And I, I think it's a great niche. Like, I think it's a huge win and it's a huge, hugely needed, um, thing. And especially for, especially for women, um, you know, but there could be some male athletes out there that, that might be reaching out to you as well, because I think, I think that's the hard thing is seeing beyond, you know, what, what you've been about for so many years and, you know, like you've played soccer forever and that's kind of who you are or you've played basketball forever. And and then it's like, Oh, what now? You know? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's kind of your, it's your identity. Mm -hmm. Um, and then it's like, how do I, how do I transition and, and use all my skills? Um, you know, I've been highly successful in my sport, how do I continue to, to transition into that next career and find happiness? And, you know, I think that um, we're just trying to make that transition a lot easier because it is frustrating and it's kind of scary at times. And, um, you know, everybody always talks about the male athletes. My husband happens to be one. Um, and so I was so concerned about him and all these other people were so concerned at how he was going to transition. And then it was like, wait, wait a minute. You know, I didn't realize how difficult it was going to be for me. Um, So, uh, you know, we're happy to have something in place uh, so that the females don't have to go through that. And yes, as you mentioned, the males have a difficult time, too. But uh, I think this is the first company that actually is dedicated strictly towards the, the female fan base, which is amazing. Yeah. And and yeah, I oh. The, I just want to help spread the message of, of your company because I it's it's awesome. It's absolutely, thank you. It's absolutely awesome. So, and I I love what Ange had to say the other day. We were talking to one of our female clients that we're helping out right now, and she said, you know, we're working with the females because we have different needs, mm-hmm. and and that for me was kind of like you're just, you're so right. I mean, we understand what those needs are and we're happy to be able to help, um, the transition. So it is exciting. Yeah. And you know, you touch what, what you just mentioned there. I, I often like as a coach get asked, well, is it, you know, are, are male and female players different? And some people say, Oh no, like you can treat male and female players the same way. And I'm like, no, you can't <laughs> like I've coached yeah. both. Like there's definitely, there are definitely differences and, you know, and, and that, I think that's important, you know, to to tap into and identify and um you guys are are great you know great people to do it because you've you've been there done that and you've you know been at the top of your profession and you've branched out and you know you've got a lot going on um talk to me about um your your different companies so you're you're not only just doing something with Angela what what else are you involved (laughs) with Well, um, you know, I guess after I had my first son, Connor, uh, I ended up working out, you know, up until two days before delivering him. And um, I just thought because I'm a female athlete and because fitness has always been really easy for me, Mm -hmm. that my recovery would be just as easy. And, you know, throughout, I, I found out actually how hard it was. And, you know, I know how many moms, um, have a hard time getting back after having their babies. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted just to kind of have something in place, uh, to help them to get back to that happy place. Um, you know, there's so many positive benefits of, um, exercising throughout your pregnancy that help not only the mom, but also the baby that I wanted to be able to translate that also. And then there's other things. Um, I ended up, uh, suffering, it's called diastasis recti Mm -hmm. and it's where your abs end up splitting. Um, and I guess two third, uh, two thirds of, of pregnant moms end up suffering it, Mm -hmm. but don't know. 
Okay. Um, so I was able to go and get diagnosed and have the proper um, exercises in place to be able to help uh, to make sure that it doesn't get worse. And it usually ends up leading to uh, what they call mommy tummy. Um, mm-hmm. I think a lot of pregnant moms think it's just, you know, I had babies, like this is what it's supposed to be like. But actually, if you do the proper exercises, it can help to make it better. So just kind of more of an educational, but also an empowering uh, option for pregnant women to be able to get back in shape, stay in shape. And I just think it leads to so many positive benefits and, and happiness and healthiness for, for you and the baby. So that was something that was important to me. Um, I did it throughout my second pregnancy with Blake and uh, you know, it was just something to to be able to to share with with moms um i feel like you know once you have your your kids you're in this little mommy club and i just wanted to be able to to empower moms to be able to have something out there for them that that's fantastic and it's your website is heather mitts empowered pregnancy.com and i i'm on the website and it's it's great and and i think that you know that too is a big challenge and question, you know, even with whether you're a female athlete on the field or whether you're a female coach, like people think, oh gosh, like life stops when you have a kid. And it's like, no, you can do whatever you want. You know, you can stay fit. I mean, I, I'm just thinking of, you know, the, the, the female players that have babies and they're boom right back out on the field. I mean, you've got, like, oh, it's, you know. It's unbelievable. And I, I love seeing it. I think it's so great. Um, you know, I think about Amy Rodriguez mm-hmm. and Sydney LaRue um, right back out there on the field, the first weekend back with the NWSL, both scoring goals. And, uh, you know, I'm like, it's, it's I love seeing that. I love cheering on these women um, because they're just overcoming so much adversity and it's just great for other people to see. Yeah. I, I loved, I watched uh, the highlights of Sydney's celebration after she scored and it was so cute to see her and her and Amy going crazy after the goal mm-hmm. and, and just, you know, to have that sense of accomplishment of, yes, I can do it all. I can be a high level athlete. Yeah. I can be a mom. I can be a wife. I can, you know, I can have, I can have the same things that, that anybody else can and, and, and have that high level. So. Yeah. yeah I love it. It's great to see it's, it's girl power. It's yep. mommy power all combined. Absolutely. So did now with this empowered pregnancy, is this something you just launched recently or has it within the past year? Yes. Okay. It was a long time in the works. Okay. Um, you know, it was kind of one of those things where I kept talking about it and saying I wanted to do it. And then, um, you know, we didn't actually start filming to my second trimester. So I only have my second trimester and third trimester, but we have six options for each. So 12 total. Um, I mean, I, I was filming up until the very end of my pregnancy. And then we finally were able to, to launch it um, this past fall. So it has been a long time coming, but I was just so proud to finally just have it out there to have the website up, up and running. Um, but yes, it's been, you know, just kind of with Sarah's, it's been a slow process of trying to, to get the word out about it. So I do appreciate you having me on. Yeah, no, no problem. And um, we'll, we'll get this pumped out and we can do we can do some articles for soccer nation on, on all the great stuff that, that you're doing. And Oh, thank you so much. That's amazing. I'm all about wo- girl and women power for yeah, sure. Thank you. Me for too. Sure, for sure. So you also have, you know, besides the empowered pregnancy.com, you also have um, your own camps and, and other things going on. So can you tell me more about that? Like you, you, you and Andrew, like the ultimate, entrepreneurs. I was, when I was interviewing her, I was like, and you're doing this and you're doing that. Like, do you have a twin? (laughs) Like, how do you keep up with all of it? Yeah. I'm just actually trying to keep up with Ange. Um, (laughs) she's my inspiration. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, I've always loved camps. I loved camps when I was younger. Mm -hmm. I loved them. So when I first started playing professionally, I was like, I want to camp. You know, I want my own camp at home. Um, and so I have actually been doing my camp in Cincinnati for, gosh, probably like 10 years. And then um, just now that I'm I'm located in Philadelphia, I'm actually going to start one here in the fall. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's changed in a lot of ways over the years. Um, I'm now going to focus 
on having a defensive specific camp okay. uh, since I did play defense and uh, fitness also, which I felt like was kind of my bread and butter with the national team. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm going to focus more on that. And I'm really excited about the, the changes that are going to take place. Um, you know, I think now, especially what I'm hearing from college coaches, because I did a couple interviews with uh, Erica Walsh at Penn State and okay. Becky Burley at University of Florida, who just tell me that defense is lacking in the college game. Right. And I figured that that's what my focus was when I was playing. So why not teach the things that, you know, helped me to have the most success, um, be able to share those with the, the youth players. And so hopefully I'll have that opportunity to be able to just help uh, share the skills uh, required to help the players at the next level. Right. So I'm really excited about that. that. That's great. And I love the fact that, that you go back to your hometown and, and you know, are invested there because I think that's so important for for people to, you know, like recognize and remember where they came from and, and, and got their roots and everything. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, Cincinnati, uh, it's a great place to have grown up um you know I'm so fortunate to have the support that I've had from the city and the fans and my family's still there so to have the chance to go home I mean that's kind of the dream come true is to have uh, a soccer camp uh in the city that you grew up in and where it all began so I absolutely love it I will continue to do it no matter what and um you know I am excited about teaming up with uh rose lavelle okay. actually yeah, in cincinnati, she's from cincinnati. So i forgot that yeah. we're we're it's been a little bit more challenging uh trying to get her schedule right with the uh, nwsl now with the national team her she's doing double duty so we're trying to team up and she's going to do uh focus on the offensive side of things and i'm going to work on the defensive side of things and uh you know hopefully we're going to have that here in the fall oh that's fantastic and and for those of you listeners that might not know rose lavelle's name right now you you will um she's you know (laughs) recently broken into the full women's national team and she's exciting to watch like i i saw her just working offensive magic on the field and like nutmegging people in the corner. And I was like that, that, I love that. Like she's, Mm -hmm. she's a rising star for sure. And, and that's, that's, that's awesome to partner with her for sure. Yeah. She's, uh, she's had a lot of success right from the very beginning and and Jill's put her in some really, uh, difficult positions and she has come out on top. It's been really exciting. Um, I always kept saying we need someone else from Cincinnati to represent the national team since I retired. So she is doing a great job. Yeah, excited to, she's, to be partnering up with her. She's leading the leading the charge for sure. So you mentioned um, a little while ago about battling through injuries. How how was that for you um, as an athlete? Like, how, what were the challenges that that you kind of went through, and and how did you, you know, attack coming back after? some key and some like pretty, you know, life-changing injuries. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's a part of sports, you know, and I think it's, uh, the obstacles that you're faced with will just make you a better person, a better athlete. Um, if you go and approach them correctly, um, you know, I tore my ACL, uh, right before the 2007 world cup. Um, I would have been starting and playing in that. And so that was pretty devastating with the timing. Um, mm-hmm. but it was also probably one of the best things that ever could have happened to me because it made me realize how much I loved playing and what I was willing to do to get back out there on the playing field. Um, you know, I was pretty devastated at first feeling pretty sorry for myself. Uh, but you know, I pretty much allowed myself one day to feel that way. <laughs> you had one day and pity party and you're like, one let's, day, let's do this. Yeah. Cause I feel like there's nothing good that's going to come out of feeling bad for yourself. So you might as well just change your attitude and try to make the most of it. So, you know, the next day I went into rehab with that positive attitude that I've always had that's helped me in the soccer field. I was willing to go in there and just do anything and be very coachable and try to get a little bit better every single day. Um, and those things helped me to get better faster and to come back even stronger. Um, I actually think I came back a better player after I tore my ACL. Um, because I started to focus on my weaknesses. Mm -hmm. And so it allowed me to become more of a well-rounded soccer player. And then obviously when 
that's taken away from you. You're willing to do everything. You have a different mindset, a different attitude. You want it more. And, you know, luckily I was able to come back and, and start and play every single minute of the 2008 World Cup or Olympics. Mm -hmm. And we won a gold medal. Um, so I ask this question of all my guests and it's some, it might be a hard question, but, um, who has kind of inspired you in your life? And it doesn't have to be one person. It can be different people at different times of your life, but who, is there anyone that, that, you know, like good mentors or coaches or, you know, your family or whomever? Um, yeah, I think my, my parents, obviously from young age, um, you know, were both very active, uh, great role models. Um, my dad having played in, in college sports and just always wanted me to go out there and, and try harder than everybody else and always have a positive attitude. And I think all those things have really helped me um, to have success throughout you know, my career on the field and off. Um, and then I guess uh, in, in college, I really did look up to Danielle Fotopoulos a lot. Mm -hmm. um, you know, she was an older player. She had been in with the national team, but, you know, she transferred uh, in my freshman year. And I just felt like she was such an amazing captain. Um, mm -hmm. She had a great balance of, you know, when you could go out and you could have fun uh, with everybody and have a really close-knit team. But at the same time, when you're out there in the field, you know, you put in the work and you're dedicated. Um, mm -hmm. And that was always, you know, some, somebody, somebody I really looked up to in college. Um, I would say on the national team, uh, Christy Rampone, uh, mm -hmm. I think was such a phenomenal um, role model and, and captain. Uh, she was truly inspirational in the fact that she had two kids on top of it. You know, I just, she always amazed me. Um, I never wanted to have kids while I was playing and I'm glad it was a great decision for me. Right. Uh, but, you know, I was just in awe of her being able to juggle everything and I still am. <laughs> um, yeah. So I've had some, some pretty amazing role models along the way. And obviously Billie Jean King for all that she has done for, for women in sports and equality. Yeah. She's legend, legend. I would like, th that's one person I would love, love just to interview or, or sit with or, you know, have a coffee with and just listen to her stories and journey. She's been... Yeah, well, I'm, I'm a part of the Women's Sports Foundation, and um, I absolutely love the event. And I remember the very first time uh, we went, I think it was after the 2004 Olympics, our whole entire team went, and Billie Jean King, you know, was just hanging out with all the athletes, and she walked up to me, and I literally was just completely starstruck, could mm -hmm. barely even mutter a word to her because I was just in awe of her presence. Wow, oh, that's great. So talk to me, you played, what, three years in the WPS? Believe, yeah. Three or, yeah. Three or four, okay. Yeah. Yep. So talk to me about, you know, being, and that was the second professional league that's basically right. been for women. So kind of, you know, can you share with me some of your experiences there? And then I want to ask you some questions about the NWSL as a follow-up. Sure. Um I mean, it was great to have the opportunity once again to, to play professionally. Um, it always is. It's great to be in these cities and the support that we have. Um, you know, I loved being in Boston. Boston is an amazing city. The Breakers have been around, and I feel like that organization has been so dedicated to, to women's soccer. Um, so to be able to, to go there and to play for Tony DiCicco, um, you know, I really loved that experience. And, um it's just some, it's just so different to play for the national team and then to play professionally. Um, it's a different vibe. Um, and then to have an opportunity to once again, to come here to Philadelphia, I played for the, the charge right out of college, um, just living out the dream and to be able to come here to Philadelphia and come back was just kind of a dream come true for me. I was living here. I met my husband here. Um, and, yeah, it's it was just a great opportunity to have the league back again. Uh, it was unfortunate that it couldn't succeed, but I do think that the NWSL is doing it right. Mm -hmm. uh, they started with a really uh, a lower budget, um, paying the players a lot less. 
Um, and now they've had the new restructuring thanks to the new um, national team uh, contract right. and the NWSL contract. They've increased the salary. So they're doing it the right way, and I'm happy to see. And I do think that it's going to help the league to continue to be around, yeah. um, which is, you know, for any player that's been there and for the future, I think that's, you know, positive. Yeah. So you just mentioned um, it being a different experience playing pro than it was being with the national team. So how, how, what, what were those differences and, and what was your, like, what did you see as your role being a national team player on, you know, the Boston breakers and, you know, within the other players, like what was your, what was your role? Were you, a, you know, were you trying to take younger players under your wing or what kind of what, what did that consist of? Yeah, I mean, it is, it is different. You're a national team player and you're playing at the highest caliber and that's a lot of what a lot of the other players that are playing in the league aspire to be. So, you know, you're being that role model for them, uh, showing them that, you know, what it takes every single day out there on the field to be at that level. Um, you know, it's about professionalism and, you know, just trying to be a role model for all the younger players. And, you know, it's funny because I I came out of college. I thought my college career was going to be over um, and I was going to be done playing. And luckily, the WSA started right then and there. So I had this opportunity. I thought I was going to maybe go play one or two years and then go back and get my master's in sports broadcasting. And through playing in the league, I had the opportunity with the national team. So that's what that is for a lot of the college players. It's, it's an opportunity to live out your dream to continue to play professionally and, you know, hopefully get an opportunity to play at the next level, which is on the national team. Right. And you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, but what are your thoughts about current national team players going abroad to play pro? Do you have any, any thoughts on that? You know, it's tough because you want them to stay here and continue to help this league grow. But at the same time, um, you know, playing abroad uh, is a great experience for a lot of these players. Mm -hmm. So I don't blame them for doing it. Right. Um, I think the nice thing is that you can go over there for a couple months, which Alex Morgan and Chris Ledun and Carly Lloyd are doing right now. Um, but then you come back and you finish out here with the NWSL. So you kind of get a double dip, um, right. I think. You know, the fans and I'm sure the organization would love for those players to stay here. But at the same time, your lifespan as a soccer player is so short. Mm -hmm. You have to do um, what is going to help you to be the best player you can possibly be. I think the level of the NWSL, NWSL will continue to grow mm -hmm. because of it because they don't want these players to leave. Right. And so now I think, you know, the fact that they have increased the salaries for those players I think that the level will continue to grow and to be where it needs to be for the players in the future to stay here rather than going overseas. Yeah. No, I, I one of my one of my male friends asked me that question. I think it was when when Carly announced that she was going abroad and he's like, "What do you think about that?" And and I I answered him and I said, "Look, people encourage male soccer players to go abroad." And it should be the same thing for women, you know, like it, mm -hmm. it, it, it's like we're, we're excited when, you know, Landon Donovan went and played for Everton. And, you know, so we should be excited when Carly's over there, or when Alex is right. over there and Crystal, because then they can bring back, you know, those experiences back to the to the NWSL and, you know, the Lindsay Horans and, you know, Tobin Heath that, that have gone abroad. And, and now those two players are back playing um you know, within the NWSL. So I think it's, I think it's a great thing. And, and you know, it'll, it's going to take, it's going to take time, but I'm just so excited that the NWSL is in the fifth season and it seems just to be getting momentum. And there's people, I was, um, I was with a, a, a group of uh, adult women players over the weekend and they were playing in the women's adult state cup here in California. And literally one of the women was sitting at dinner and she's watching, you know, NWSL game feed on her phone during dinner. And I, like I sat back and I was like, 
it's getting it's getting there you know there are there yeah. are fans out there that are literally on twitter like checking scores and stuff like that and like that made me so excited to see uh, a female who's like in her 20 you know she's 25 and she's still just playing on a women's team and she's a teacher but she's like literally like following the league like a fanatical fan and and it's it's great it's great and and I just I want a team I want a franchise here in California <laughs> like I, I want them to bring a team here so. you can make that happen right Carrie well we're hoping we're hoping that you know LAFC or maybe there's a franchise that might come to fruition down in San Diego for the for the men's side we're hoping to maybe get something out this way so th- there's talent yeah, that here. Would be great. There's a lot of there's so many oh. players out here, you know. Oh, it's you're like... kidding. There's so much talent in California. Yeah. Um, it would make make a lot of sense, and I, I hope we do continue to see um, growth and expansion. But I do think right now that they're doing it right by starting small and yeah. then slowly growing. I mean, we've, we're even seeing MLS continue to do that. So. Yeah. They've had so much success, and we can just hope to have the same. So yeah. it's great to see just for for soccer here in the United States. Yeah, no, I I totally agree, and and I always my mom lives. I always mention my mom lives in Portland, but the Portland Thorns. Like if you've ever Ugh. if you've ever gone to a game there, it is an amazing experience. And amazing, yeah, amazing. I we played with the national team. Uh, a game there and it was on this really tiny not great field but I tell you what we didn't care because the atmosphere was insane I mean it gives me chills thinking about how amazing it was and you know I'm envious of the players that get to play in Portland and play in front of that fan base every single day I think it's great yeah like they I mean they have separate chants for the women's team and they I mean it it, it just amazed me I went couple a couple years ago and the 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 men's the timbers played on saturday and the women played on sunday and literally you couldn't tell which game you were at because the, env- awesome. the environment was was so similar and, and you had the supporters group and you know you walked in and they gave you um a, a printed roster on really you know like high quality handout with the chants and the the roster with pictures and i was like this is this is how it needs to be done and and mm-hmm. You know, I mean, they're lucky because they've piggybacked their women's team with, with the men's franchise and they, right. they've used, you know, they're utilizing staff to, to do, you know, um, game management and things like that, which I think is a great model. Um, and I, you know, maybe that could be kind of the, the blueprint for adding yeah. new franchises as, as the, it, as it slowly evolves. Um, yeah, I think you're onto something. <laughs> Well, let's, 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 let's hope, let's hope so. Cause I, I, I really, <laughs> I, you know, I, I just looking at the, the number of, of girls that, that play soccer, it's like that, that momentum is, is going to get there. I feel in the next like five to 10 years of, of women and girls really becoming fans. Um, of the, oh, absolutely. Of the With game. all the success that, yeah, the women have had and continue to have in the league and just everything and just the growth of soccer here in the United States, how many kids are playing. It's, it's, it's exciting to see. I love it. Yeah, no, it's, it's great. Um, so let me ask you this. If, what would you say, and this is, this is kind of putting you on the spot. What would you say to your younger self if you could like go back and, and do something Oof. again, something again Gosh. in your career? We, we don't have enough time for this. Um. <laughs> well, well, you know, what are, I mean, or, or maybe what are some things that you would give advice to, you know, up and coming players that, that you can say, well, I did it this way, but if I had to do it again, I would maybe have done something like this instead or, or th- mm, you know, little things geez. to focus on that, that. Yeah. Um, I would say uh, working on the juggling, mm-hmm. uh, taking a ball and going and finding a wall and just touching the ball as much as you possibly can, different ways, uh, different parts of your foot, um, you know, one touch, two touch, bouncing the ball, trying to get out of the air. I mean, just, I think about Tobin Heath, for instance, you know, mm-hmm. just how comfortable she is with a ball. I guarantee she lived with the ball at her feet as, as a young child and it shows on the field. So just having that comfort level, um, kids hate juggling. Uh, I used to hate juggling. It wasn't until 
Carly Lloyd. Um, I started training with her and James Galanis, and mm-hmm. here I was. I think I was 26 years old, and he sent me home with homework, five minutes on your right, five minutes on your left, five minutes alternating. And I couldn't believe that I was as awful as I was at my juggling, but I stuck with it. And I saw a huge improvement just within a couple of days. And I swear just from training with him and doing the juggling and all those things, it really did help me so much more um, with my touch on the field. Um, So it's never too late. uh, And that's just something simple that you can do on your own, but it just takes dedication. Um, But I love the fact that you can do it on your own. You don't need other people. So it really is kind of up to you. Mm -hmm. Um, I think you just always need to, to set, goals for yourself Mm -hmm. uh but like attainable goals that allow you to reach your ultimate goal um we all like to work on the things that we're good at because it makes us feel good uh, about ourselves and it gives us confidence and i think that's great but i also think you have to be really realistic at working on your weaknesses also because uh, you'll become more of a complete player um and i think always just being coachable uh, be willing to play any position and even though it's uncomfortable you might not be good at it you work on those things you'll just be more valuable to any team mm-hmm. um and i think you know for being a good teammate you know people are gonna remember you for how you acted on and off the field um your body language when you're not playing in a game when you have an injury just being supportive it's all those little things that you know, it's, it's how you want to be remembered, um, not only as a player, but as a person. Right. That all of that is fantastic advice. And, and I think that's one thing, you know, having coached, um, youth players for, for quite a long time, a lot of times players look to you as a coach and say, well, you know, I have to come to practice in order to train or get better. And it's like, no, you can go out in your backyard and you can go out to a tennis court with a hitting wall and you can really, you know, make yourself better and work on your left foot and and work on those weaknesses. And I think, you know, it's, that's a great message coming from, from someone like you that's played at the highest level that said, look, I'm still not the best player I can be. I can, I have got stuff to work on. And, and that's, that's great to hear because, you know, hopefully, Hopefully the listeners out there will say, hey, you know, like there are things that that we can continue to work on. And it's not. Oh, yeah. That that was one of the things I always loved about soccer was that there was always something to work on that Mm -hmm. you could always get better. And so I literally even towards the end of my career, when I wasn't sure if I was going to make the Olympic team, Mm -hmm. I didn't feel like I was getting um, even a look from Pia Sundagi, but I went out there and I told myself, just get a little bit better every single day. Just right. prove to yourself that you're capable of more. Mm-hmm. And just that attitude of going out there and being positive, being a good teammate, being coachable, having a positive attitude, and just trying to get better every single day allowed me to make that Olympic roster and to go out on top of the game. Right. So just to kind of never give up. Yeah. And control what you can control, you know, like you can't control Control the controllable. Yeah. You can't control a coach's decision. You can't control anything outside of what you put into it. So. Right. Yeah. That's, that's, that's great advice. Um, and this is, this is another hard question. Um, do you have like a, a, a favorite or most memorable moment within the game? And you've had so many because you've had like, you know, the Olympics and World Cups, but is there anything, you know, one particular thing that is your, like, mm. this was the the, the pinnacle or? <laughs> um, gosh, I still think to this day, you know, it, it's, I've had so many fabulous uh, feelings and, and so much success, luckily, uh, on the playing field. I would, probably just say my meeting with Pia uh, trying to make my final Olympics and as I had mentioned um, to you I legitimately did not think I was going to make the roster Mm -hmm. Um, but I went out there every single day and I just I never gave up and I always had a positive attitude I never stopped working Um, and I just I just wanted to 
be a good teammate and and to enjoy my moments out there with my teammates um, since I thought it would be my last. Mm -hmm. And I guess it was in that meeting. um, She had told me, you know, when you cramped up in January and you had that injury, I I told the coaches that you would never play for this team again. Mm -hmm. But you went out there and you never gave up. And for that, um, you have proven me wrong. And that's why you're making – this Olympic roster, um, you've been a great teammate, you've been coachable, and you never gave up. And that kind of just puts everything in perspective, um, you know, just to be able to, to go out there and, and to prove to yourself uh, that you are capable and that hard work and a positive attitude will pay off. Um, and everything else just kind of played out, and I was able to walk away um, on, you know, the best possible uh golden note um in my career wow that that's that's power that's really powerful thank you for thanks for sharing that that story oh no problem i know it was it was a mouthful no (laughs) well and and that and that's the thing that that i think is the the off the field stories like a, a meeting with a coach or things like that, that, that I, I find interesting because, you know, the, the general public only sees professional athletes in the big games or on TV or, you know, and we don't really see what goes into it. Like, you know, overcoming Mm -hmm. injuries or, you know, dealing with the adversities that, that the, you know, the fans don't ever get to hear about or see. And and so that's, that's, that's a good, good story and very cool very powerful and it it, you know and and I love how that your experiences there now you're rolling them into being able to help women and executives of like hey you got to put yourself out there and you got to never give up and who cares if you know you're transitioning like you got to use what you you did on the field or on the court or or whatever and, and apply them to your daily life so exactly yeah, I'm so lucky to to have this opportunity just to be working with Ange. Ange is such a you know, successful and fabulous person. Um, it's just very cool to be able to work together and help other females. Um, I just think it's it's much needed and you know, the whole female empowerment and helping one another is just so important to both of us. So we're we're really lucky and we appreciate you having us on, Carrie. Yeah, no no problem whatsoever. Um, couple, couple of last questions here, and this one's kind of off the wall um, a little bit. So, your husband is also also a professional athlete. How does how does that work with the competitiveness in your household? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny because we the only time we get competitive is when we play tennis or squash. Okay, it's so bizarre. <laughs> <laughs> and AJ's never played either, really. Um, he's just naturally good at everything. Right. Um, and I did have a tennis background. I played competitively till I was 12. Mm-hmm. Um, so I have a little bit more experience. But uh, every other sport, we could care less. Uh, we don't ever get competitive. But for some odd reason, we play those two sports. We <laughs> do um, find the competitive uh, spirit definitely taken over a little bit. Right. Um, so we got to be like, whoa. Okay. I mean, it's all in good fun. I do know how to get him because I always beat him. But um, <laughs> I was going to ask who wins. <laughs> who wins? <laughs> I, I was, I'm glad you brought he, it up. I, I tell you it, what, he comes pretty close. Yeah. Sometimes I'm going, oh my goodness, he's never even played these sports. How, how is it getting this close? But right. sometimes he gets in my head. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> That's great. Um, so, and another kind of random question What are you going to do if your kids don't play soccer? Is that, uh, is, is that going to be a hurdle you know, for you or is that, are you not even uh, thinking about that? I'm already preparing myself that it's not going to happen. Yeah. So if it does, then it's just icing on the cake. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, honestly, I, I feel like because we are both uh, former athletes that our kids probably just going to be in the band. So that's what we're, <laughs> we're aiming for. That's what we're planning for. And anything else, just a bonus. Oh, that's funny. Oh goodness! Any more kids on the on the horizon, or are you are you stopping it too? Um, you know, we we were strictly stopping it too, but then all of a sudden it's become a discussion. So we shall see what happens. All right, 
That's I love that. Sorry to pry, but I I was just wanting to. No, it's want, okay. It's funny because to... we were like, no, two and done. I'm giving away my baby clothes. And all, <laughs> we've started having this conversation again, but I am almost 40 years old. So, you know, I, I figured we'll give ourselves a short window and if it happens, great. If it doesn't, then we are so happy with our little boy and our little girl. That's a, that's awesome. There's nothing wrong with being almost 40. So I'm in my early forties yeah. oh, and it no, is fabulous. It is fabulous. So let me tell you, like, it's fabulous. I turned 44 this past year and I was like, I love, I love it. It's great. So you're Good. you're wiser well, I have, I have, and more experienced and it's life life is definitely definitely good in your 40s so I'm I'm just hoping that I have the right amount of energy and I'm a very energetic person to be able to give all three of my children so right. that's the only thing I'm I'm talking about but yeah. yeah they keep me on my toes and they keep me young for sure yeah I bet Awesome. Well, we can start to wrap up here and um how what's what are some of your um, social media handles and do you want to give any shout outs to anyone as we kind of wrap up? Um, gosh, uh, just, you know, uh, I guess to Angela Hughes, who, you know, I've been fortunate enough to be able to play alongside her um, in the Olympics and we remain good friends. Um, and now we have started this brand new company together and I just, can't wait to be able to help other females um in this journey along with Ange and uh you know just all to all the the females out there you know I think it's um we're very fortunate to have the opportunity uh to support one another and I hope we continue to do so awesome 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 so I just want to shout out your website again so he heather mitts mitts empowered pregnancy.com um serious platinum group.com that's c-e-r-e-s platinum group.com and then your twitter twitter handle is at heather mitts um did i miss anything on that at heather mitts my instagram is h mitts two okay um and then i have a nice little fun fan page on facebook also so um, try to be as active as I possibly can be, um, on there. And then I also have a, um, Instagram, uh, empowered pregnancy also, which is going to really ramp up here. Um, when I can get my act together, uh, with a lot of like health and fitness and, um, exercise, uh, videos. So I'm actually really excited about that. Great. Well, I think there's, I mean that again, like all of, all of the things that, that you're doing, there's such a avoid in so the the empowered pregnancy.com I you know I'm I'm not a mom but I know I know there's people and women out there I have a good friend of mine she's a, a coach and she's getting ready to have baby number two so I'm gonna I'm gonna send this awesome. send this to her yeah, and yeah she's a cool. former, former player and coach and she's like you know doing it all sort of like you are and so I'm gonna let her know about that but Cool. Well, I'd be so curious to get her honest feedback because um, I, you know, I have a couple girlfriends that are trying it out right now okay. and they are not athletes. Um, so I'd actually love to hear someone that is, is active, but has yeah. been a former athlete to see if it's challenging enough for them. Okay. Well, what I'll do is offline, I'll connect you guys. She played at Clemson and I think she might've played... I want to say she might have played in WPS for at least one year. Jenny, Jenny oh, cool. Hammond or Anderson Hammond is her name. So, um, but yeah, I'll connect you offline cause she's, she's a workout aholic. So cool. Can... Yeah. I'd be so curious cause I actually did, I did it and I was, I was in better shape my second time around than the first time. So I'd be curious to see if it, what she thinks of it. Okay. Yeah. I'll definitely connect you guys for sure. So um, I just want to wrap up today. So I want a big thanks to having Heather Mitts on the show. Thank you for giving your time. And um, our social media handles are, um, you can find us on Facebook at Women Talking Football, on our website at womentalkingfootball.com, and on Twitter at WO Talk Football, or on my personal Twitter at Carrie1v1. I um, want to give a big shout out to Soccer Nation, who is one of our presenting sponsors of Women Talking Football. 
And all the listeners out there, thanks for tuning into the show and helping grow the beautiful game that we all love and has given us so much. So Heather, thanks again for taking your time and I will be keeping up with all the awesome things that you're doing and I wish you the best of luck and, um, you know, keep promoting and empowering women. So thanks. Thanks for all you do. And I really, really, really appreciate having you on. And same to you, Carrie. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Okay. Well, have a good day and uh, thanks for tuning in to Women Talking Football.